was an amazing year, um, but I was very, very lonely that year, and so Paul McCartney kept me company. And this is really what I think my book, I hope, is about for you. It's the fact that those of us who write have been given a gift of friendship and kindness because Paul was there for me every moment of that year. And he was my greatest friend and my great love, and he absolutely kept me company. So I would like to read you a few short sections from much later in the book. This is in, um, I think it's um, May 1965, so I am now 14. So there's a family scene, and then there's a bit from one of my stories, and then there's another Paris scene. How's he doing? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yes. And just again, so you know, the stories are quoted, the story about Paul is quoted verbatim from my notebook of the time. A few weeks later, when supper was late and I was very hungry, I walked into the kitchen. Mum was ironing, Dad frying some steak. <clears throat> they commanded me to set the table. Mum said, are you cold? You look cold when you came in. I was always cold. Dad called me frileuse, which means always cold. <laughs> yes, I'm freezing. I let out a big sigh. And I feel faint from hunger. That brought the wave over my head. I'm tempted to smack her so hard when she's acting the drama queen like that, said my father. I walked into the living room to set the table as the voices trailed after me. You know, Gord, said my mother, if that child were left to fend for herself, she'd starve to death. She'd live on tea and toast. Dad saying, no university will ever accept her with work habits like hers. I went to my room to avoid hearing them, clenching my hands, biting my tongue, murmuring, Paul, Paul, Paul. If I didn't have Paul to love me, I thought, I'd go insane. When supper began, so did Dad talking to Mum as if I weren't there. That child really should get an award for melodrama, the Sarah Hartburn Oscar. I hung on to my dear dream husband, but though I fought to hold them back, the tears started. I don't want to hear that noise anymore, Dad said. You can cry all you want, but from now on, I do not want to hear it. I fled to my room, locked the door behind me, and wept without making a sound. At least I had this haven, this plain room with my 50 Beatle pictures and my diary. After dinner, Dad wanted to talk to me and tried to get in. When he discovered the locked door, he was furious. This door is not under any circumstances to be locked again, do you hear me? He shouted. If only he would disappear, vanish forever. I could not have hated him more. I spent the weekend shut in my room with a luscious new story I called a three-nighter, meaning I could spin out the excitement that long. Paul, my husband, <laughs> landed in hospital, desperately ill with pneumonia. I was frantic with worry. One night, the doctor called to tell me to come immediately. Paul was dying. I sped to the hospital in Paul's Aston Martin <laughs> and ran to his side. There he lay, struggling to breathe under an oxygen tent, looking small and helpless, his eyelashes dark against his white, white face. The doctor pulled Paul's left hand out of the oxygen tent and took his pulse. Very weak, he said. I'd give him two hours. My heart became cold as ice. Doctor, I said, could I? Could I hold his hand? He looked uncertain, then decided, okay. I reached into the oxygen tent and took Paul's hand, so cold where it had once been so warm, so tender. I held it as if it were my last possession on earth. It almost was. Maybe this is my imagination, but I think that helped him. When the pain was bad, he would try to clench his hand, but only succeeded in grasping mine. After a few hours, hours that I lived in mortal fears, the doctor had only given him two of them, I noticed that his breathing seemed slightly easier. I called in the doctor, who wasn't impressed, only concerned about me. You've been here t almost 20 hours already. Do go home and get some sleep. <laughs> sleep? Are you crazy? I'm sure he's getting better, doctor. I'm sure. He looked pityingly at me, went out and brought me some coffee. I almost spilled it as I drank it with my left hand. My right was in Paul's, and I wasn't letting go. 
Hours more, I sat there, and I became certain that his pain had become less and his breathing easier. Heart full of hope, I continued my watch, though my lids were heavy. John entered. <laughs> Do you realize, he whispered, it's one o'clock. You've been here 24 hours. Get some sleep. Oh, John, excitedly, I'm sure he's getting better. He stayed with me for two hours. We were joined by Cynthia and George for a bit. They were all as hopeful as I. Gradually, Paul seemed to work his way out of the death cloud that shadowed him. Even the doctor was encouraged. It's a miracle, Mrs. McCartney, he said. I didn't know who to thank, God or the penicillin. I spent days drifting inside that story. I could see him in the hospital bed, thin and pale. I could feel my hand reaching for his and the warmth that moved between us and saved his life. My heart felt swollen, twice its normal size with love and happiness. What could be better than writing? Only love. One early evening after school, I got off the metro and walked toward the ugly concrete apartment building in the distance, our home. A cloudy gray day and around me the dumpy buildings of Gentilly. I was wearing my favorite outfit, a green corduroy A-line skirt and light green poor boy sweater carrying my heavy cartable book bag full of homework. Instead of passing the boulangerie, a bakery filled with a window, uh, sorry, a bakery with a window filled with sticky golden treasure, I went in. Bon après-midi, monsieur dame, sang the little woman with the mustache who ran the place. <laughs> I loved how customers always greeted the people serving in stores, and how shopkeepers called everyone Monsieur Dame as if they couldn't tell what sex you were. <laughs> bon après midi, madame, un pain au chocolat, s'il vous plaît, I replied. She handed me a little paper bag. I resumed my walk home, taking a careful bite of the flaky pastry surrounding a dark river of chocolate. Suddenly, I had one of those moments when the camera flashes freezing the instant forever in a mental photograph album. I was walking on the sidewalk beside the dirty cobblestone street of Chantilly, my left shoulder weighed down with my cartable, and in my right hand, the delicious treat. I'd taken two bites. How many were left? Three or four? I bit, chewed, looked at what was left. Time was passing this way. Just as my pain au chocolat was disappearing, so was my life. I tried to slow down. Another bite, the sweet, stretchy crumminess of the pastry, the explosion of dark, sweet melting that was the chocolate. I explored it in my mouth as I walked. Soon I would be home. Soon my treat would be gone. Soon I would be old. Only two bites left, a small piece. I held it, felt it in my fingers, brought it to my nose and inhaled deeply the yeasty smell of France. If I didn't eat this piece, but kept it safely somewhere, would that mean I could control time? That I would not die? But I couldn't stop, it was too good, and I was still hungry. I took the second last bite. Across the street, a fat old woman of maybe 50 opened her door and came out with her plaid shopping cart. She wore a shapeless yellow tweed coat and clumpy brown shoes and was frowning at the sky. I promised myself that no matter how old I got, I would never look like that. <laughs> this was it, the last bite. I popped it into my mouth, swallowed, and licked my fingers. The pain au chocolat was gone. It had been there, a puff of deliciousness in my hand, and now my hand was empty. I felt my body moving home, young in her green clothes. Here I am. I am here. <laughs> So thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to say, oh, just a few other things, um, which I have lost here. Excuse me for one second. Oh, yeah, so I just, um, just before we go, I'm going to let you go and we can eat and I can start to drink. <laughs>
is, um, first of all, I'm also starting a reading series this week. It's been a productive few weeks. So uh, on Friday, there's going to be a reading series. Um, there's, there are brochures over at the table. If you're interested, I'm starting a series of reading and storytelling with my best students and for myself. And it's going to be every other month on the last Friday of the month at the Black Swan on um, the Danforth. So that is also starting. And uh, I'm running one of my writing workshops in July. So um, I just uh, I wanted to tell you guys about those things. Oh, yes, and also that my next book is called True to Life, 50 Steps to Help You Write Your Own Story. And it's based on my teaching, and it's more or less ready to go. So that is supposed to come out in August. So, but we won't have another party. Um, oh, yes. Yes, Sam is saying, remind them to buy this book. Yes, I'm going to remind you to buy this book. And I also, this is one last thing that I would like to ask you. The marketing budget for this book is exactly zero. Uh, the marketing plan is that every time someone writes me something nice about the book, I post it on my blog. So I just wanted to ask you that if you do like the book, uh, the, what, this is the way things are done now, if you could post on Facebook about it, if you could Twitter about it, if you could please um, review it for Amazon.ca or Amazon.com, I would be very grateful because that's how this book is going to get out into the world. And that is how my beloved Paul is going to find out. About it. Thank you all so much.